Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good morning, uh, welcome you all for the next lecture on inorganic chemistry of life. Let us just have a brief uh, recap on the previous uh, aspects that I have covered. Just in the previous lecture, I began with this techniques which are used in the biological inorganic chemistry, bio inorganic chemistry. A list of the same can be seen over there uh, as I have already shown in the previous lecture. Of this, a few aspects I have already completed, uh, the aspects such as the protein isolation purification, something on the C D spectroscopy, uh, something on the gel electrophoresis and uh, a single crystal x-ray diffraction, I have also completed things related to uh, the microscopy etcetera. So, in this lecture and the lecture followed by this, I will try to uh, sort of go through the major spectroscopy techniques that I will be that are generally used in the biological inorganic chemistry or in other words inorganic chemistry of life. Because they, you need to evaluate the reactions that happen uh, in the biological system uh, where the proteins are one of the major portions or cellular material. So, for this you require both the spectroscopy and microscopy methods. Let us look at uh, one of the method here. Uh, see, we have methods on absorption spectroscopy, we have methods on emission spectroscopy, we have methods on uh, nuclear spin, we have methods on electron spin and we also have uh, methods in the nuclear transitions. Uh, so, variety of these methods are there as you can see uh, on the previous uh, ones. The nuclear transition is basically the moss boyer spectroscopy and NMR and DPR refers to the electron spin and nuclear spin uh, methods. Okay. So, let us start with one on the emission spectroscopy. Okay. So, what is emission spectroscopy? In an emission spectroscopy, you have to have a species which is an excited state, which is an electronically excited state. So, you know absorption spectroscopy will have the electron transition from the ground electronic state to an excited electronic state. Now, with emission spectroscopy, you look at what happens uh, an excited electron when it returns back to the ground state and that is what. So, the kind of a emission that occurs that you are looking at in the form of radiation. Of course, there are other ways by which the excited state can be uh, quenched which is called radiation less processes. But we are concerned with the radiation process and this radiation process is referred as the emission spectroscopy and the one which is uh, which is very commonly used is the fluorescence spectroscopy. Okay. So, in case of uh, biological systems the uh, fluorescence spectroscopy can be used primarily for those species which can be easily electronically excited. For example, those amino acid residues having a uh, the side chains of aromatic type. Uh, we know we have already seen the aromatic like side chains you have in the histidine, you have in the phenylalanine, you have in the tyrosine, you have in the tryptophan etcetera etcetera. So, we have looked at all of these. So, that means all of these are very well suited candidates for studying their fluorescent spectroscopy. Secondly, why they are so suited because they are a part of the protein. If there is some change in the protein or dynamics in the protein, then obviously that change in the protein, conformational change in the protein or dynamic change in the protein would reflect on the emission properties of these particular residues. Therefore, monitoring their intrinsic uh, you know uh, fluorescence emission is an important thing. So, could be phenylalanine, could be tryptophan, could be uh, you know tyrosine all of these kind of things. Occasionally people will also do something called extrinsic one. In the extrinsic one what you do is you attach certain kind of a uh, fluorophores, a fluorescent moieties and then study their fluorescence uh, as a function of whatever changes that you bring. 
change in the concentration, change in the pH, change in the temperature, change in the viscosity, change in the whatever kind of a changes that occur in the biological system or when they go from a fluid part to, the, to, a, uh, to a, a tissue part etc. all of these can be. So, that means emission for measuring the emission spectroscopy you require fluorescent moieties. These fluorescent moieties could be intrinsic like those present in phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine etc. or these can be an extrinsic fluorescent species which are attached directly to the protein for studying the protein changes that can be attached at one, another, one end of the protein or they can be attached somewhere in the middle of the protein or in any portion of the protein. That means, protein is modified with a fluorophore and such a kind of things is referred as extrinsic fluorophores and those of tryptophan, phenylalanine, histidine all of these are referred as the, uh, the intrinsic fluorophores. Okay. So, let us look at one example a chromophore modification that affects on the uh, fluorescent protein. Okay. So, the emission spectra. So, you can look at one of the case is uh, the emission blue B stands for blue here and the fluorescence uh, 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 protein and then in the second case here uh, uh, the cyan color emission cyan fluorescent protein then uh, F uh, uh, emission green G stands for green fluorescent protein and uh, emission Y, Y stands for yellow. So, emission Y uh, that is yellow uh, fluorescent protein. So, we have different modifications the blue one gives the uh, gives the emission here, the cyan one gives the emission over there, the uh, green one gives the emission over here, the yellow one gives the emission over there. So, you can see the emission wavelength is shifted that means, emission color is also shifted. So, this can be helpful to study the protein uh, dynamics, protein conformation etcetera by looking at the changes either in the intensity or in the position of the emission or both in some cases that you can see uh, in all of these. Okay. And let us look at uh, uh, another example. But this example is not just simply based on the uh, on the emission, but it is based on the excited state lifetime. As I mentioned to you the emission spectroscopy comes out because there is electronic transition from the ground to the excited electronic state and this ground to the elect excited electron state will uh, make the species in the excited state. And now, the excited state will not remain in the excited, but that will return back to the ground state. So, return back to the ground state there is a time taken in this. So, that is what the time taken for this that you study excited state lifetime measurements. Generally, these lifetimes are in microseconds, uh, in the nanoseconds, femtoseconds all these kinds of things 10 power 6, minus 6, minus 9, minus 12 etcetera, minus 15 etcetera. So, in the fluorescence they are there in the phosphorescence of course, you know that they are in the milliseconds to, to even a fraction of second to seconds as well. So, therefore, we are going to we are looking at how what is the rate or what is the time rate and time are uh, related to each other uh, rate and time are inversely related to each other. Okay. So, 1 by time is the rate 1 by rate is the time. So, therefore, it does not matter if I use the word rate of uh, uh, excited state uh, decay or if I say lifetime of the excited state. So, the excited state lifetime means how long the species sits in the excited state. Okay. So, this is again uh, the lifetime is dependent on various parameters the parameters of the protein dynamics itself, protein conformation itself and viscosity of the medium many other parameters so pH of the medium various things. So, all of these will influence the excited state in some cases it will stay longer in the excited state in some other cases they stay uh, uh, shorter in the excited state therefore, excited state lifetime becomes an important parameter for us to monitor if we want to study the dynamics of the protein uh, or not only dynamics suppose you have a small molecule which reacts with the enzyme. In case of enzymes what are the small molecules which reacts? In case of the enzymes it is the substrates, substrates bind to the uh, bind to the enzyme. 
So, when the substrate binds to the enzyme, there are some changes can occur in this conformation. When the uh, substrate is converted to the product, again there could be some changes in the conformation. When the product is released, there can be some changes in the conformation of the protein. So, all of these conformational changes or in other words some kind of a dynamics can be studied by excited by following the excited state lifetime measurements. These are dependent on the uh, various parameters like viscosity, dynamics, conformational changes, pH, various other factors, concentrations all of these like the ones. So, very nice. So, if you have an enzyme uh, you want to understand whether the whether the uh, the substrate is bound or not you can study. So, you want to study whether the whether the enzyme the substrate enzyme has acted on the substrate has converted the substrate into the product or not that can also be studied various things. So, here I have taken an example slightly different in nature. This example is coming from a protein called eye lens protein. You know that we have several proteins that function in the eye lens and some of these proteins get modified as a function of age time as a human grows that you know you must have heard some of your elders saying that oh I am not able to have a good vision, I am not able to see very well. That is because they have certain kind of a layer they call it as which is nothing but cataract. So, the cataract is nothing but for a chemist it is nothing but some kind of a modification of the protein. Okay. So, what can modify in the protein? The various side chains can modify in the protein. Some of these can be even glycosylations. So, all of these will modify when they modify some of the proteins may join together may aggregate. So, protein is modified because the side chain is modified the modified protein is in turn is added up together to form a kind of a polymeric species. So, you form a kind of a layer the individual protein molecules are making connecting together this is like suppose you have these lens proteins are like a rod like molecules that you have. So, and you have another rod like molecule and you have another rod like molecule you have another rod like molecule etcetera. So, these are individual lens proteins. Okay. So, these these lens proteins uh, due to the modifications they get connected to that. So, they get connected to that. So, they are modified in various ways and these modifications can be explained. Now, this forms like a individual rods are joined together now form a kind of a layer which we call it as a uh, cataract formation. So, so this is what is the disease and we as a uh, chemist can uh, can identify such kind of things. So, you can identify such things because the when it is modified any of the you know, thing is modified you can see that the modified portions their dynamics is different therefore, lifetimes are different when they are connected together the lifetime will also change. So, here we have shown some example when some modifications are brought here as you can see in this particular lens protein uh, some modifications simple tryptophan, hydroxy tryptophan, orginin P variety of these modifications. It is not necessary what these modifications are at this time for us to know all that we know is that these amino acid side chains are modified. Some of these modifications will lead to the aggregation phenomena. So, the, the protein to protein rod to rod rod to rod can join like the way that I have shown you here and these are all joined together and to form a kind of a layer. So, so such kind of things can be studied. So, when the modifications can be studied because uh, the shift in their emission they also change in their emission pattern in terms of the lifetime. So, we, all of these uh, things are referred as the lifetime decay curves and these decay curves are generally fitted to exponentials it can be 1 exponential, uh, 2 exponential, 3 exponential that is uh, monofunctional, bifunctional, trifunctional etcetera. So, these are some other things that we can. So, we can resolve these and get the uh, lifetime measurements and the lifetimes will vary as a composition of what kind of a changes have taken place to what extent they have taken a place in this. So, I think this much of a message is good enough. So, that means what I would like to say is using the emission spectroscopy, using the excited state lifetime measurements you can uh, you can study very clearly 
the binding of the, pro, uh, the substrate to the protein or enzyme, the reactivity of the uh, substrate to convert to the product and the changes that occur in all these and all of these kind of a parameters or changes in the pH, changes in the dynamics of this uh, or temperature, everything can be monitored. So, very well. So, that is one of the very vital technique. Now, let us smoothly switch over to another technique. Another technique is mass spectrometry. What is a mass spectrometry? Mass spectrometry is based on the mass. So, mass of a species, mass of a, an ion, a mass of a molecule when it is converted into an ion. Okay. So, therefore, you convert the molecule into an ion and you measure uh, that. So, from that you can get the mass of this. Okay. So, the molecules are uh, converted into their ions and these ions are measured. So, more details of mass spectrometry I am not giving here the instrumental details, but I would give details of how it can be utilized. So, there are a large number of mass spectrometry methods are there of which I am talking to you about two other techniques. One is ESI, electrospray ionization mass spectrometry and the other one is called MOLDI. What is MOLDI? Matrix assisted laser desorption ionization, matrix assist assisted laser desorption ionization spectroscopy. Generally for smaller size uh, peptides, molecules, you can use ESIMS. For bigger size proteins and huge molecular weight proteins, they are all studied by uh, MOLDI spectroscopy. And both of these uh, will not bring much of a um, you know breakage in the molecule, but just makes a soft ionization. So, these are all soft ionization processes in that. So, uh, so, in this you have a electro spray which is a solvated electron which gets added to your molecule and convert into uh, a species ionizable species and that species you are measuring. In the other you have uh, you mix your compound a molecule or a protein with a matrix protein it is a matrix which and then shine with a laser light and the laser light is absorbed by the matrix and then transfers this energy to the uh, uh, to the uh, molecule and then as a result of that molecule gets ionized, molecule gets desorbed, desorbed and ionized. That is what you study in the uh, MOLDI. So, here is some example as I told you and you know very well in mass spectrometry uh, you basically have uh, an, uh, a piece of information of importance is that uh, what you measure is uh, m by z. Okay. So, you measure m by z. Okay. So, z is the uh, charge. So, this charge can be 1, it can be 2, it can be 3, it can be any number. So, if it is a negative charge minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, if it is a positive charge plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, etc. So, that means the peak uh, position is uh, peak position uh, in mass spectrometry. Uh, MS spectrometry is referred as the M by Z. So, in that the Z it refers to the charge. So, if you want to get the mass is equal to the peak position in the spectrum multiplied by Z value. So, this will give actual mass. So, this will give uh, actual mass. So, this you will find in the spectrum from the spectrum and you can also find the charging. So, therefore, you can get the uh, mass of the uh, species. So, this is an important thing. Now, here uh, there is some example is uh, taken over here. Okay. So, it is not very important what this example is, but this happens to be the uh, cytochrome C. Cytochrome C just take as it is and put into the electro spray ionization mass spectrometry, you get one peak for the 9 charges. So, whatever the value you get multiplied by 9 will be the molecular weight of that particular thing. Now, as I said that the Z can be played with. So, the Z means can be uh, charges can be added, can be removed. This can happen by adding a charge for example. 
So, you can add the charge by adding some kind of a uh, acid to that. Okay. So, uh, so you add acid, acid medium is uh, for example, trifluoroacetic acid. Okay. So, trifluoroacetic acid which is TFA this will add charge H plus to the protein. So, this will add H plus to the protein. So, therefore, uh, that is that can be really understood and now you see the spectrum here compared to this you get more number of uh, uh, species. So, species with 9 plus and 11 plus 13 plus 15 plus 17 plus etcetera and then you can also charge a lot. So, then you can see much more charge like even 22 plus 25 plus etcetera all of these kind of things are there. So, one of the thing that we learn from this is simple protein may not be able to uh, solve the structure, solve the mass of this of this particular protein. Then you add some acid that will uh, the basically denature and to this denatured protein you can add more and more H plus and then more and more H plus will add to Z. So, Z value increasing. So, Z value can become 1, can become 2, can become 3, can become 4. Here we have even uh, you know 11, 13, 15, here you have uh, 22, 23, etc., 24, all these kinds of things. So, from this you can solve, resolve and get the uh, protein mass in that. You can also make some changes in the in the instrumental parameters can get a little bit more uh, or you know ions to 11, 13, 15, 11, 11 plus charge, 12 plus charge, 13 plus charge, 14 plus charge, 15 plus charge. So, what we understand from this? We understand from this when you have a protein, protein has side chains. You have seen carboxylic groups, you have seen phenolic groups, you have seen amine groups, you have seen amide moieties, you have seen uh, many, many kind of a groups are there. So, these groups you can either add a proton, imidazole is also there. You can add a proton, you can remove a proton. So, when you add a proton, you are adding one mass plus one charge. So, addition of proton, so addition of uh, proton, addition of proton is one uh, mass added plus one charge added. So, uh, that is how you need to calculate and get the corresponding thing. So, now you know how many charges you added, how many protons you added etcetera from that you can make out. So, so this is possible because the there are a lot of side chains in the protein uh, which can absorb or take a, uh, protons. So, can be protonated. So, can be protonated by some extent, by more extent, much more extent too. This is one other technique which is very commonly used. Uh, for the ESI MS uh, spectrum. The uh, other technique is the moldy assisted laser absorb or desorption ionization. You can see uh, the one of the example is shown for a, a small uh, peptide 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 uh, uh, a peptide, a 9 amino acid peptide as you can see that uh, the corresponding peaks are obtained over here. Uh, in this case also you can get resolve uh, the peaks into different uh, charged which I will show you on the next slide, but you can see that this particular thing basically one can study the uh, uh, study the mass out of these ones. Okay. In the next slide uh, here you can see the moldy for two proteins, this is the one on the left side, one on the right side. The one on the left side is met interleukin is a protein interleukin 2 a protein whose molecular weight is 15,549 that means around 15.5 kd kilo dalton we refer generally as a kilo dalton. Okay. So, protein mo molecular weights are generally in kilo daltons protein molecular weights uh, in kilo daltons these are referred as kd. Okay, kd. So, you will have uh, 5 kd, 10 kd, 50 kd, 100 kd, 200 kd, 100,000 kd, there are proteins of all these. 
Now, here you can see that interleukin 15,000, you have a peak for 12 charges, 13 charges, 14 charges. Using more than 2 or 3 of these, you can solve the, uh, 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 the mass for this one. And here bovine serum albumin, it is a huge protein because it is a tetramer. So, bovine uh, albumin uh, is a tetramer, it can also, also can be called as a bovine serum albumin and its molecular weight is 66,300, 66,300 which is called 66.3 kilo Dalton. And you can see that, but that means more number of residues, more number of uh, side chains, so therefore more charges is possible. Here you will have about 150 to 170 amino acids, here you will have 650 to 700 amino acids. So, obviously the thing is uh, increased by at least 4 times. So, the molecular weight of this 15,000, 60,000 about 4 times, you can see the charges 14, 15, 16. You can see here uh, 55, 60, 65. So, everything is increased by 4 times. The, the, the number of residues are increased by 4 times, the mass mm, is increased by 4 times. The charge species, these are all z values z value 50 plus, 55 plus, 60 plus, 65 plus. So, using this you can solve the molecular mass of this. Now, let me tell you uh, which I have not shown in the slide. When you uh, do in the earlier slide, I have shown that the people isolate the proteins from cells, from other materials, etc. When you isolate, you purify too. At certain stages of initial stages of purification, the protein what you want is there, also some other proteins there. How do we know that so easily? So, you can use the Moldy technique because the mass of those uh, impure proteins, impurity proteins is different from the mass of the uh, of the actual protein. So, therefore, from the Moldy you can find out the protein impurity too. So, uh, uh, isolated proteins purify, then you get a pure protein this can be evaluated by purity uh, can be evaluated by moldy. So, you can find uh, if there are some impurities, what kind of impurities, everything you can find, Ex excellent kind of a uh, technique uh, that you have. Uh, so, let us see the next part of it uh, is the uh, mass spectrometry, then then we go to the uh, uh, NMO spectroscopy. So, let us look at the NMO spectroscopy. We are very familiar with NMO spectroscopy. What is NMO spectroscopy? Nuclear magnetic resonance, that is nuclear spin, uh, spin of the nucleus having the spins of plus half, nuclear spins or it can take uh, plus half and minus half too. Okay? So, therefore, uh, uh, these two under magnetic field, uh, uh, these two having same energy uh, outside the magnetic field, so let us say plus half and minus half and you apply a magnetic field. So, these are uh, in the magnetic field, these are split into the uh, plus half into minus half. Okay? So, the species which are present to the other, this is the uh, transition. So, in other words, you cause a trans nuclear spin transition going from one kind of a spin to the other spin that will result in the nuclear spin transition. Uh, uh, kind of a uh, technique and this requires energy and this is in the uh, radio frequency. This is the h nu is equal to h nu. So, by supplying that kind of an energy you can cause the transition. And generally in the NMR in the diamagnetic means organic molecules if you take their, uh, uh, their proton NMR spectrum runs somewhere between uh, let us say proton 1 H NMR of diamagnetic goes from 0 to 15 uh, ppm. Okay? Whereas, when you have some uh, species 
such as uh, uh, when, when you have some species which is a paramagnetic species when you have and these uh, the uh, shifts magnet, uh, the uh, in a more spectral uh, they shift in the under the presence of the paramagnetic species under the presence of the paramagnetic species. So, the paramagnetic species Uh, shifts uh, the chemical shift position O known as delta. Okay. So, the delta can be changed uh, the, the other parameter that can also shift is uh, the relaxation time. And in metallo enzymes, you know there are a lot of uh, metal ions are involved, transition metal ions, and these transition metal ions are uh, basically uh, have some of them will have the paramagnetism. So therefore, one can easily make out uh, structures by using these such kind of a paramagnetic uh, species. And this. Here we have taken one molecule, uh, the phenanthylene, uh, the, the complex of the cobalt three plus, but the cobalt three plus here is d six where all electrons are paired and this is diamagnetic. So, in this diamagnetic kind of a system then you have a uh, you have no shifts happening in this and therefore, you get the spectrum very uh, small in region 0, 0 to 10 or 0 to 50, but instead of the, uh, the cobalt 3 you take cobalt 2. So, the cobalt 2 is paramagnetic. Now, you see the same set of peaks have spread to almost 100, 110 ppm from going from 0 to 10 ppm is going from 0 to 110 ppm and that is what is called the paramagnetic uh, shift. So, this is called the uh, paramagnetic shift uh, or the contact shift. So, this is a do, uh, boon in disguise you know because in metal proteins the metal ion is connected to different uh, uh, side chain residues of the protein and therefore, those residues where it is connected directly and if the metal ion is uh, paramagnetic they can be shifted here too. Okay. Just an example is shown over there you take some uh, uh, hexanol and add some shift reagent which is a europium compound. In the simple hexanol everything is within 5 ppm and hexanol with the europium complex that you see it goes much down field and each of the uh, CH2 group can be separated out one CH2 other CH2 other CH2 other CH2 other CH2. Okay. So, in effect what I would like to say is that uh, the paramagnetic and a more generally organic chemist thinks is a curse, but for a bio inorganic chemist biological inorganic chemist is a boon and the paramagnetism will shift the spectrum and as a result of that we can get the uh, different things resolved. Uh, and in the next class I will uh, I will demonstrate one example of this and then explain you much uh, better. So, uh, yeah thank you very much.